The 1930s was brimming with cultural and political change. Al Capone was finally jailed in 1931 and the Empire State Building was completed alongside the Rio Christ Redeemer statue. Franklin Roosevelt was elected President of America and Amelia Earhart flew solo across the Atlantic. Although it wasn't all roses for the 30s, we saw the Great Depression sweep across America, shortly followed by the Prohibition. Across the Atlantic, Hitler rose as Führer to Germany and the Spanish Civil War tore through Spain. A broadcasting of War of the Worlds sent people into mass panic and the Dust Bowl swept across the prairie lands. The 1930s was a decade that ended with the declaration of World War II. On the one side are Mr Henderson's socialists, who by their extravagance wrecked the financial stability of the country. And when faced with the responsibility of taking the necessary measures to save a crash in the value of the pound, which would have brought suffering and privation to all classes in the country, deserted their posts through fear of the consequences and left it to those who were prepared to put country before party to rescue the nation from the impending disaster. It is preeminently the time to speak the truth frankly and boldly, nor need we shrink from honestly facing conditions in our country today, this great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. in sie Zusicherung zu geben, dass die deutschen Streitkräfte das Staatsgebiet ohne die Besitzungen folgender unabhängiger, unabhängiger Nationen nicht angreifen und vor allem nicht dort einmarschieren würden. Und er nennt als dafür in Frage kommend nun Finnland, Lettland, Litauen, Estland, Norwegen, Schweden, Dänemark, Niederlande, Belgien, Großbritannien, Irland, Frankreich, Portugal, Spanien, die Schweiz, Liechtenstein, Luxemburg, Polen, Ungarn, Rumänien, Jugoslawien, Russland, Bulgarien, Türkei, Irak, Arabien, Syrien, Palästina, Ägypten.
truth school. In the art world, a whole new spectrum of surrealism was opening up, with people like Dali, Picasso, O'Keeffe and Duchamp reigning supreme. Each piece created by either side was a symbolic or literal reflection of life in the 1930s. Dorothea Lange brought a harrowing light onto the Great Depression that was choking America. She did this alongside Walker Evans and Margaret White Falk. Whilst across the Atlantic, Bill Brandt started to document the lives of the Great British Class Divide. He started in London, in the West End, the suburbs and the slums. From everything that went on inside the large houses of wealthy families to the chaos of a working class home. He photographed pubs, lodging houses, theatres, Turkish baths, prisons and simply people in their bedrooms. After several years of working in London, he travelled to the north of England and photographed the coal miners during the Industrial Depression. Brandt was able to document the harsh reality of this time, but also a symbolic beauty of our country was very apparent in his black and white photographs. Brandt was the first to document life in Britain like this, and his images now hold a sense of wonder to how life used to be. Although German born, Brandt was in love with Britain and everything it offered him. <laughs> By the end of the 1930s, Brandt had compiled a collection of images that would go down in the history of photography as some of the greatest documentary photography seen to date. Now it wasn't all gritty truth and serious faces in the 30s, surrealism was roaring through the art world. Although it started in the 1920s, it seemed to evolve in this new century and Max Ernst, a forefather of the movement, left his mark, starting with an appearance in Le Age d'Or. Created by Bunel, Le Age d'Or was an attack on bourgeois society and the Roman Catholic Church. The plot loosely focuses around a man and a woman who are passionately in love, but their attempts to consummate their passion are constantly thwarted by their families, by the church and by the bourgeois society in general. Max Ernst made an appearance as a leader of men and marked his entrance into the 1930s. Ernst went on to produce a graphic novel called Une Semaine de Bont. It was completed in 1933 and came in five books. Each book represented a day and an element, with the fifth and final divided into three. No full interpretation of the graphic novel has ever been published. The book has been described as projecting recurrent themes of sexuality, anti-clericalism and violence by dislocating the visual significance of the material to suggest what has been repressed. Although by 1934, Ernst would invest his artistic genius into this realm of sculpture. Influenced by Albert Giacometti, he created an original writing characterised by a search for forms impregnated by multiple influences of his pictorial research. His main focuses were African masks, his passion for birds and the game of chess. Ernst loved to work in bronze. In his hometown of Brühl, there sits in his museum two of his major works, the Capricorn and the King playing with the Queen. Ernst had a passion for chess and had been quoted saying that he thought, chess is a living sculpture where the forms of each piece confront in a metaphysical dance. So from the same century came two opposing forces, sharing only the fact that they were both born in Germany, something Brandt would later go on to deny. Two men created beauty within the social and political chaos of the 1930s, and Ernst found love with Dorothea Tanning in 1946. They wed and moved to the south of France, whereas Brandt never married, but preferred the solitude of his own company, sadly passing away in London, where it all began in 1983.